Thank you to Rebecca for her children's moment. You know, she asked a good question. What makes you sad? What makes you sad? Yeah, I can think about it like this. Uh, this week, when will it be uh, Friday, Faith and I will celebrate our 33rd wedding anniversary. Kind of getting old. I don't know. I mean, if it's... That's applause more for her than for me. But, no, that doesn't make me sad. She said, does that make me sad? What, what makes me sad is that she still hates my beard. Um, we have this ongoing thing. She goes, how long are you going to keep it? I'm thinking, well, forever, but, you know, anyway. And I think she's been talking to some of the kids in the church because I walk in the high school room today, and uh, one high schooler who I won't name, Emily Gibbs, um, but she says, hey, it's the weirdo with the beardo. So I, don't, you know. I feel like Rodney Dangerfield. I get no respect. But, but Rebecca asked a really good question. What makes you sad? See, because we're going to look at one of the Beatitudes today in which it kind of is a very much a paradox. Uh, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We are in the second week now of what's going to actually be an extended series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5, it is Jesus' greatest teaching, uh, sort of opens up his ministry. And in a nutshell, the Sermon on the Mount is not the things you do to become a Christian they're the things you do because you're already a Christian. So, for example, thinking about my anniversary, there was a time when I would go uh, and, and bring a flower to faith or something like this because I wanted to win her affection. Well, presumably now I have her affection. If I bring her flowers, it's because we're already in that relationship. And, and the Sermon amounts much like that. It's about Jesus is saying, those who have the kingdom of God within them, this is what they look like. This is how they live. And so it's going to be a good barometer for us as we go through to say, you know, am I exhibiting these things in my life? Am I salt and light? Is my righteousness more than surface deep? You know, am I projecting the love of God and, and the grace of Christ in, in what I do? And the Sermon on the Mount begins with Beatitudes, these eight proclamations or eight blessings that seem and, and actually are so counterintuitive to the way that the world works. In fact, if you're not confused by the Beatitudes at some point, you're not really getting them, you're not really wrestling with them, because they tell you what Jesus calls blessed doesn't seem very blessed from the world's perspective, but he says, you've got to look at it with new eyes, you've got to look at it with kingdom eyes. And so again, Rebecca asks that question, what makes you sad, what makes you mourn, what makes you grieve? Jesus is actually, blessed are those who are mourned, they will be comforted, what's he mean? We're going to look at that today. Now, I have two scripture passages. We're going to look at the Beatitudes again, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be looking at the uh, verses 1 through 4 and then skipping over to the Gospel of John. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. It says, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And then skipping over to John's gospel, we look at John chapter 11, and a little background to this text. Um, you'll know the story, the raising up of Lazarus. Um, Jesus is in another place. He gets word that Lazarus, who is a good friend, that is Lazarus is very ill and, and on death's door. And, and the Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, send urgent word to Jesus, please come, please heal your friend Lazarus. And yet Jesus doesn't go right away. He remains where he is, and it puzzles his friends, his disciples, and Jesus says, this death, this sickness will not end in death, but will bring God glory, and uh, Jesus stays until Lazarus dies. He actually delays his going there for this very purpose, and so uh, when he goes there, he meets Mary, and he meets Martha, and everybody, their, their hearts are broken. Their brother is gone. They, you know, the, the head of their household is gone, and um, it picks up where Jesus has just talked with Martha. He's just talked with Mary. We get the idea Mary is more the, um, the more sensitive of the two sisters. And, and her heart's broken. She's weeping. Martha's weeping. Everybody's crying. And we pick up in verse 33 where it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, meaning Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? Jesus asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Let's just tarry on that verse for a minute. Shortest verse in the Bible, by the way, trivia question. Jesus wept. 
Jesus wept, but why did he weep? Lazarus is gone, but Jesus knows what he's going to do. So let's keep that in the back of our mind. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word, the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. In Jesus' holy name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. You know, uh, just for kicks the other day, I decided to count the number of funerals I've done over the years. I lead a really exciting life, I I know. But I've, I've got this book in which I've recorded every sermon I've ever preached, every marriage I've ever performed, every baptism I've ever celebrated, and every funeral I've ever officiated. And so I opened the book, and when I counted them all up, I've discovered that I've done 169 funerals to date. 169 times I've either stepped to the pulpit or stood beside an open grave alongside those who were mourning the loss of someone they loved. Over the years, I've I've buried both husbands and wives. I've buried those who've struggled with long illnesses and those whose sudden passing came as a shock. Young and old... I've been with families when the heart-wrenching decision to turn life support off was made, and I've stood beside them watching their loved ones slip away. I was at a funeral home once doing visitation for somebody else, and the funeral director actually pulled me out of line because in the other room there was another service and the minister didn't show up and he asked if I could sub in. I've even laid my own grandmother and my mother-in-law, Faith's mom, to rest. And if I've learned anything through all these times, it's that grief, well, grief is very real, and everybody grieves in their own unique way. In my reading this week, I came across the story of a woman named Barbara Roberts. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but Roberts is the former governor of Oregon. And in a book titled... Death Without Denial, Grief Without Apology. She writes about dealing with the grief she experienced in the aftermath of her husband Frank's passing. And she says this, I want to share part of it with you. She says, Frank died on Halloween and he would be interred on his birthday, December 28th. I brought him home for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Construction workers were finishing a new room at the mausoleum where his remains would be placed in a few more weeks. But especially during this season, I couldn't face the thought of Frank's urn in the dark, lonely mausoleum vault. Frank was home for the holidays, but I couldn't tell anyone. So I stood crying in the lovely big bedroom along with his ashes, the devastating memories of his death and my secret life of grieving. And then I did what I do every afternoon. I walked over to his urn put both hands on this lovely piece of art and said, hi, honey, I'm home. 
in this room, in, in this sanctuary, I, I could still talk to Frank, report about my day, kiss his photograph, and wrap myself in his robe. Here, holding the urn in my lap, I could tell him how I struggled through each day without him. And she adds, do not think you're crazy, or let anyone tell you you are when you do things like this. She says, if you're questioning whether it's okay to grieve in your own way, then I give you permission to weep. Weep loudly. Take his sweatshirt to bed. Talk about her and to her. Keep pictures in the living room and, and set an empty place at the table. Watch old movies and videotapes that show that familiar face. Hug a pillow and rock yourself. Put your feet in his shoes or wear her ring on a chain under your clothing next to your skin. Cry out his name in the night. Visit her grave as often as you need to. Do the things that help you through a day, a week, a year, two years. And through all of it, remember, it takes as long as it takes. Blessed are those who mourn, Jesus said, for they will be comforted. You know, there's a sense, of course, that when Jesus talks about mourning, this what Roberts describes, this, this is what he means. Dealing with this devastating loss of someone we love, picking up the pieces and trying somehow to go on. And it's what we usually mean, isn't it? But there's actually a lot more to this idea of mourning and, and blessedness than dealing with the loss of someone we love. It's, it's that, no doubt. I don't want you to get me wrong, but, but it's also more. Whether it's standing beside an open grave coming home to an empty house, comforting an abused child, encouraging someone whose marriage may have fallen apart, or just looking deep into our own hearts and knowing something just isn't right, that neither we nor the world around us are completely as we should be. To mourn, in a biblical sense, means having our hearts broken by the things that break God's heart. You see, far from being a sign of little faith or, or no faith, Mourning and grief and sorrow can actually be signs of great faith because deep down in a place far deeper than words can ever express, those who mourn are acknowledging a truth, the truth that things are not the way they're supposed to be and it's to hope for something more, to hope for something better. Author Tony Campolo, he tells a story of speaking once to a group, I think it was a church group, and uh, he made a very provocative statement. And, and if you know Cam Polo, uh, he's, he's older now, but he's full of provocative statements. He's actually, Cam Polo was one of my inspirations for going into ministry. I remember uh, hearing him speak in the 1980s and, and being just mesmerized by his passion for Jesus. Although there's a lot Cam Polo's come out for since that time, which the Bible doesn't support. So, so I, I love Cam Polo, but I'm, I'm cautious at the same time. And one day, Campolo, he's, he's speaking to this church group, and he said, I, I have three things I'd like to say today. First, while you were sleeping last night, 30,000 kids around the world died of starvation or diseases related to malnutrition. 30,000 kids died last night. He said, second, most of you don't give a blank. And this is where he inserted an expletive that I can't repeat here. And then third, he said, you know, what's worse is that you're more upset with the fact that I said blank than with the fact that 30,000 kids died last night. And I'll admit, I wouldn't have said it the way Tony did, but he's right. See, he, he was calling folks out and challenging them to consider whether what breaks God's heart really breaks our hearts as well. I mean, you know, does it break our hearts that tens of thousands of children across the globe die each day because they don't have enough to eat in a world where there is more than enough? Does it break our hearts when we pick up the paper and read that the drug overdoses in Cabell County have already eclipsed last year's all-time high and there's still four months to go in the year? Does it break our hearts to see senseless violence break out across the country or to know deep within ourselves that we're only a shadow of what God created us to be and then instead of cooperating with him, we often resist his sanctifying call in our lives? Does it break my heart? Well, the truth, the truth is not nearly enough. 
But Jesus said it should. To mourn as Jesus means it is to have our hearts in sync with God's heart. It means to be moved by what moves God. And what moves God is seeing his beloved creation, you and me and everything we see around us, to see it touched and tainted by sin. Now, I'm, I'm going to date myself here, but there's an old TV commercial that really captures it well. And some of you might remember it. I'd be curious. Raise your hand if you do. It's somewhat of a classic. It opens with this Native American Indian paddling his canoe. Spencer's already, you know where I'm going with this. He's paddling his canoe down a pristine river, just, just beautiful scenery around him. And as, as he goes along, he begins to paddle by little bits of trash floating in the water, and he continues on, and, and the river widens into this, this large shipping inlet flanked by factories spewing pollution. There's a little more trash in the water, and then he pulls his canoe up on shore, and the shoreline is littered, I mean, just filthy with garbage, and, and he walks to a nearby highway where, where someone throws a bag of trash out their window, and it, it spills at his feet. And then the camera focuses on him looking out on all this mess. Anybody remember this commercial? And we see him turn to the camera and a lone tear begins to run down his cheek. You know, I think this is, I think this is how God feels when, when he looks at the heartache and the heartbreak in the world. You see, to mourn in the truest biblical sense isn't, isn't just grieving over personal loss. It's that. But it's also, and more so, to grieve over a world spoiled by sin and to know this is never how it was meant to be. Because only those who mourn what's become of the world and what's become of themselves can ever be open to God's healing. This is why Jesus says those who mourn are blessed. I know it's a paradox, but it's, it's not simply about being sad for sadness' sake. It's grief over sin and what sin has done to us, what sin has done to the world. And this is what moves Jesus so deeply at Lazarus' tomb. I mean, you know, I, I said, think about this. If you think about the story, Jesus arrives at Lazarus' grave four days after he had passed, and, and the scene is deeply moving. Everybody's crying. Everybody's heartbroken. Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, they're consumed with grief. Men are beating their chests. Women are, are wailing. Everybody is broken up about Lazarus' death. And so we might think of Jesus as simply being caught up in all the emotion too. And it, and it was emotional. But for Jesus, it was far more than that. You see, from start to finish, from the very beginning of the story, Jesus knows how it's all going to turn out. He says as much at the beginning when he tells his disciples that Lazarus' death, his sickness, would not end in death, but would be used to glorify God. He then even promises Martha, if you remember, he says, your brother will rise again. So Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He knew Lazarus wasn't going to stay in that grave. He knew in a minute Lazarus would be right as rain and everyone would be happy again, and yet he still grieves. He still mourns. The scripture says Jesus wept. And the question is, why? I think the answer is very simple. And it goes to the heart of what it means to truly mourn. You see, what troubled Jesus wasn't just Lazarus' passing. What troubled him most was seeing what had become of his beloved creation, that the way things were were never the way God meant them to be, that Lazarus laying dead in that lonely tomb was a repudiation of everything God had ever meant for us, everything he ever intended for us, and it literally brought God himself to tears. Author Cameron Lee says this, he says, imagine the scene through Jesus' eyes. He knew how God had meant things to be, and it grieved him to see the world out of alignment with that divine intent. Others saw only the death of a single man, but Jesus saw death itself as a black stain on creation. In her book, Hope Has Its Reasons, Rebecca Manley Pippert, she recalls watching the news one day, uh, and the news was showing scenes of uh, some violence and brutality, and, and it was people hurting one another, bloodshed, and mothers sobbing over their soldiers' sons' grave sites. And, and she said she didn't really give it much thought. She was busy preparing dinner. But she says she was jarred back to reality by her three-year-old daughter. Her daughter had come into the room, and, and without noticing, um, 
she saw the carnage being played out on the TV, and the little girl, when she saw that, she cried out, Mommy, why are they doing that? Why are they so mad? Why are they being so naughty? Where is their mother? And Pippert said her daughter ran over and quickly turned off the TV in distress. And she says, there's no mistaking my daughter's reaction, fear and terror. Suddenly, I was reminded of the truth that she saw so vividly, that this is a scary world when people like us live in it. And it took the fresh eyes and perspective of someone new to the human scene to make me see it. Well, the question today is, do we see it? Do we look around and realize that the way things are are not the way God meant them to be, both in the world and in ourselves? Do we mourn our sins and do we want something different? I mean passionately different. See, this is what to mourn means. Mourning means sorrow over our sins, but not just sorrow, not just regret, but regret and sorrow that leads to repentance, to returning to him. That's how those who mourn are blessed. When our sorrow for our sins, when it drives us to Jesus and we find the forgiveness and the healing we really need. Another writer puts it like this. He says, the mourners are those who have caught a glimpse of God's new day, who ache with all their being for that day's coming, and who break out into tears when confronted with its absence. He says, the mourners are aching visionaries, such people Jesus blessed. Then he said, the Stoics of antiquity, remember the Stoics? They said, be calm, disengage yourself. But Jesus says, be open. Be open to the wounds of the world. Mourn humanity's mourning. Weep over humanity's weeping. Be wounded by humanity's wounds. Be in agony over humanity's agony. But do so in the good cheer that a day of peace is coming. And that's where Jesus says the blessing of comfort is found in the promise that a new day is coming. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You see, the thing that binds the Beatitudes, all of the Beatitudes together, the thing that holds them together is hope. Hope that the way things are are not always the way they'll be. And not because, you know, we try harder ourselves or, or we're discovering new ways of self-improvement, but because the scripture says God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. Because, you know, God wasn't satisfied any way with the things are the way out there now any more than we are either. You see, if the cross and the resurrection, they show us anything, it's that God would go to any lengths to put right what was wrong and to reclaim a world that had been lost to sin. That's why he sent his son. That's why Jesus came. The scripture says Jesus came to take up our infirmities and carries our sorrows. And he does this by taking the punishment of sin, the punishment I deserve, the punishment you deserve, we all deserve. He takes it upon himself. He absorbs all the evil the world has to give. And he conquers it, not by hate, but by love. And that's our comfort. That there isn't any price God considered too high to pay to redeem us and to recreate us. So that in the end, the things we grieve and mourn most, even within ourselves, all those things, they're rendered powerless. Because Jesus Christ got up and he walked out of that tomb. And he showed us that as far as God is concerned, the last word is never death. The last word is always life. You know, one of the most riveting things I've ever witnessed came 40 years ago, I think it was. I was a boy watching the original miniseries Roots on TV. Anybody remember the original one? Just, just epic, just world changing. And if you remember, Roots was written by author Alex Haley, and it chronicled Haley's family from the time his ancestor, Kunta Kinte, was kidnapped and enslaved and taken from Africa and brought to this country. And um, it traced his family out through his trials, his daughter's trials, to his grandson, uh, who's known as Chicken George, who brought his family's freedom and, and his freedom uh, shortly after the Civil War. 
But early on, as Kunta Kinte, he's, he's new to the country and he's rebelling against this forced enslavement. And uh, the one thing he won't do that he, won't, he absolutely will not do is he will not accept his slave name. And so he is tied to a post and he is mercilessly whipped until he finally breaks and he accepts the name Toby. Well, the scene is heartbreaking. And it's said to have profoundly affected the actors who were filming it. They said, they said as they did it, it became very real to them as this terrible scene played out. People just crying over the injustice, even, even though they're just acting. And, and as Kunta Kinte, who's played by a young LeVar Burton, as he's finally lowered to the ground, he's, he's half dead from the beating. His friend Fiddler, who's played by Lou Gossett Jr., his friend Fiddler takes him. It's almost like, a, it's almost like the scene of Jesus being lowered from the cross, and, and, and Fiddler cradles him in his arms to comfort him. And as he does, Fiddler, he speaks softly to him, and he says, he says, it, it don't matter. He knows what his real name is. His name's not Toby, it's Kunta Kinte. That's what he'll always be. And that was supposed to be the end of the scene. That was where the director was supposed to yell, cut. That's where Alex Haley stopped his writing. But Lou Gossett Jr. said it was a very emotional moment. It was so emotional, he said, that, that something just welled up from inside of him. He said it, he could feel it from his feet on up, leading him to make up to ad lib right then and there one of the most powerful lines in the whole series, something that wasn't in the script at all. So as he holds Kunta Kinte there in the ground, he looks off into the distance and he says, there's going to be a better day. Do you hear me? There's going to be another day. Well, this is what the second of the Beatitudes points to. It points to that better day. The scripture says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That better day. The Bible calls it the day of the Lord. You see, Jesus promises a better day for all of us who recognize that things aren't the way they're supposed to be, that we're not the way we're supposed to be either. For those who mourn over their sin and turn to him for healing and forgiveness, we're promised the comfort of a new day, a new way. We're promised the comfort of a new us. When everything that's wrong will be put right, and everyone who mourns every failing in themselves and turns to the cross for healing will experience what Jesus says it means, what it really means to be truly blessed. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your son. We thank you for his grace which upholds us and his grace, Lord, that even holds us in hard times and, and difficult things to hear. Lord, we see in your word, but we also know in our hearts that to have your kingdom within us means that we do mourn, Lord, over the way things are, the way things are in the world, the way things are in ourselves sometimes. Because we're not there yet, Lord. We know that, that your, your sanctifying work is continuing in us, Lord. We're not complete yet. We know we're saved, Lord, but we're not as we ultimately will be. And we mourn that, Lord. And so, Lord, in this paradoxical beatitude, Lord, we come to you today asking you to reveal to ourselves where we fall short, where, Lord, we need to mourn the failings in ourselves so that we can turn, Lord, for that wholeness and healing that only Jesus can bring. Lord, the wonderful part is that you have that vision of us when the kingdom comes. You have that vision of us, Lord, in heaven when we'll be complete. Lord, you have that vision of us that if we could see right now, Lord, as C.S. Lewis once said, we'd be sorely tempted to bow down and worship even ourselves in that glory. You see it, Lord. Help us to see it ourselves. Help us to see ourselves in the world as you meant it to be and how it will be through the cross of Christ. 
And so fill us with your spirit now, Lord. And, and not only us, but make us as a church, Lord, as you want us to be. A church that's passionate about the gospel. A church that's passionate about sharing Jesus. A church that's passionate not only inside these walls, but outside of them. Help us reflect you, Lord, in all things. And Lord, we pray for our church, for our church members, Lord, those dealing with illnesses, those struggling. Lord, even those now, Lord, who've heard these words and whose hearts are being searched really deeply, Lord, by your spirit and, and who mourn their sins. Show them you, that in you, Lord, this complete healing and forgiveness, Lord. That as your word says, you were reconciling the world to yourself in Christ, who is our hope and our salvation. Father God, we thank you for always hearing us. And Lord, it's in that sure and certain hope that we have in Jesus Christ that we join now together as one people, praying the way our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.